Hey folks, my name is Benjamin Williams. I'm the senior minister at the Central Church of Christ in Ada, Oklahoma. And tonight have kind of a, an interesting lesson in what I'm going to try to do. Um, I was asked to speak for a summer series for the Northridge Church of Christ in Shawnee. Uh, but due to all the strange circumstances going on in the world right now, uh, we're unable to meet in person. Uh, so uh, as part of their series, I'm putting this lesson up on uh, our church's YouTube stream that they can share and, and share with their members. Uh, however, as I was working on this lesson and preparing it, it, it draws from a lesson I had done a couple of years ago for a, a, a different congregation, a, a third congregation in this con conversation. And I, I was concerned that I wouldn't be doing a very good job reproducing it uh, in an empty room, which is how so many of us are preaching now. But I, I looked at kind of the, the audio from when I had done it previously in my notes and so forth, and I thought, it's just going to be better in that audio version that I'm going to be able to reproduce in a studio by myself. So I took the audio, I edited it, I put it together with some slides, and made kind of this video production that you're about to see, which means that this is a sermon uh, that I preached for one congregation being posted to the YouTube feed for another congregation for use at a third congregation. You know, the internet's wonderful, right? We can do it all at once. Uh, so if you're out there in Shawnee and you're watching this, uh, it's great to be able to be with you even virtually, and I hope this is beneficial to you. Um, this lesson was prepared on your theme for the summer of peace and uh, kind of how Christians should think about peace. This was a lesson that when I wrote it really challenged me, and so I thought it might be beneficial to you as well. Um, the text is going to come out of the 12th chapter of Luke, so if you have a Bible and you want to open up there, I'll have some of the verses on the screen, uh, but uh, otherwise I'll keep the Bible open, and hopefully you'll benefit from this lesson on Master, Teach Us Peace. Luke chapter 12, 49 through 56. I came to cast fire on the earth, and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I came to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on in one house there will be five divided, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, When you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, A shower is coming, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, There will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? This is God's word. You may think I'm a bit confused. You would be right, but not for the reason you suspect. Uh, my sermon title is Master, Teach Us Peace. And in the passage that was read for us a moment ago, Jesus said, no peace for you. Not going to have it. Uh, not only will there be no peace, I'm going to set the world on fire and burn it down. Uh, it sounds like maybe I'm a bit confused about what that passage is about, doesn't it? Uh, you're not wrong, but uh, you're not right either. It turns out... It's a difficult section to teach, but I think if we pay careful attention, this actually tells us a whole lot about peace and what Jesus has come to do. And I think maybe there's never been a better time than now to hear his message from this text. The first thing that should bother you in the scripture reading that was given to us a moment ago is when Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace. Like everything else in there is kind of metaphorical and vague. The world's going to burn. Uh, uh, there's a baptism I have to be baptized with. You know, okay, well, maybe I can understand that. I came not to bring peace, but division. Well, that's not what we were promised. The Old Testament said that he would be the Prince of Peace, and he would come with healing in his wings and bring peace to the nations, to the peoples, to heal what's wrong with our sin-sick world. Paul, looking back at what he did, said he is going to give us a peace that passes understanding. I am much more at home thinking of Jesus, the peacemaker, than I am of this particular passage. Because it's difficult, I think, to understand what he's saying, and I suspect we've often misunderstood it. 
the hint that we've misunderstood it actually comes at the end of the passage. Don't, don't stop too early. Read all the way to the end. And in fact, I want to start there. He also said to the crowds, right? This isn't just here's something else he said. Luke said, here is some more of that. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, this is verse 54, you say at once, a shower is coming, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not now, or excuse me, not know how to interpret the present time? He's telling them right up front. There is something obvious that you're missing. Okay? This isn't a passage making fun of meteorologists, although as Oklahomans we'd be fine with that. We know that's like the most imprecise of all sciences. But that's not actually the point either. That in reality, humans most of the time are not oblivious to the weather. In Oklahoma, we know if it's really hot outside and really wet outside, trouble's coming in the spring, right? Right? And we kind of have got to where we can interpret that. In their world, they had the same thing. They didn't have the National Weather Service in the first century, it turns out. They had clouds, right? They would go out and they'd look and they'd say, well, what's it look like to you? And they got pretty good at it, because people do. You live in a kind of desert climate. You can kind of anticipate when it's going to rain. You can kind of anticipate when it's going to be hot. We are capable. In fact, we are made by God. To be able to look at the evidence, the the state of things, and draw conclusions about what's happening. But when it comes to morality, when it comes to society and civilization, when it comes to our own lives, we turn that feature of our brain off. We don't want to look at what's happening and ask too many questions. I don't want to say it's going to rain because that might make it true. Rather than deal with reality of what's happening, we find a way to just ignore what's staring us right in the face. And in fact, we think people that tell us there's a problem are probably the problem. And I think that's what Jesus is getting at. If you go back now and read this text that comes to us from verses 49 through 53. Uh, There, let me just read it with you again. I, am, I came to cast fire on the earth, and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on in one house there will be five divided, three against two, two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. In In case you weren't sure, he went ahead and covered it all, all right? All the relations. What's he talking about there? One of the distinctions I've tried to point out that helps me to understand how to read difficult passages in the Bible is that some passages are what I would call descriptive and some are prescriptive. Prescriptive means it's a verse that's telling you, now do this. So on your medicine bottle, you have a prescription. Take three times daily with food. And that tells you exactly what you're supposed to do. It's a prescription. Some passages in the Bible are prescriptive. Do not worship idols. What's that? That's that's a prescription. Don't do that. It says right there on the label, don't do that. Some passages in the Bible, however, are descriptive. Meaning they're not telling you what to do. They are trying to tell you what's happening. They are describing a situation and hoping you will draw some conclusions. Most of the Bible is written that way. Right? You read uh, the book of Genesis, it's mostly stories. The commands, it has some commands, they're given to other people. Noah was told to build an ark, but we were told a story about a man who built an ark. We have a description. So when I read this passage, an important question is, is this prescriptive? Is this a prescription? Is it telling me to do something? Or is it a description of what's going on? Is this a prescriptive text? Is it telling me that this is how Jesus wants it to be? I want to suggest to you that it's not. And you get that from the text. He says, I have a uh, a baptism to be baptized with, and I am in great distress about it. Is he looking forward to it? 
Is he saying, boy, I sure hope you crucify me soon. Right? It doesn't seem like he thinks this is the best possible scenario. He is simply saying, this is the way it is. For better or worse, he says, this is what is happening right now. Like a thunderclap or a cloud in the sky, this is the weather. This is what it looks like. And you should be drawing some conclusions about that and what it says about us. What Jesus doesn't name and the people don't understand is the disease behind the symptom. So I'm changing metaphors now, but do you see the point? When you go to the doctor, you list the symptoms. My temperature is this, I feel like this, so forth. That's not actually what's wrong with you. That's describing a set of symptoms, and you want your doctor to be the weatherman to read the description and say, here's the problem and here's what we're going to do about it. And what Jesus, I think, is complaining about in this text is he says, all the symptoms are here. But you aren't looking any deeper than that. What are the symptoms? Well, you can look at them. He lists them. Uh, the world's on fire. That's a metaphor, obviously. Uh, he doesn't mean there's a grass fire in southern Judea. What he means is uh, it feels like the world's just burning down. We're, we're starting a fire, and I'm kind of eager for it to get going. I'm tired of waiting. The anticipation's killing me. And what is he trying to describe? There's something wrong on the earth. People looked around at their lives, and they said, this is a mess. He's describing the same sensation you get when you watch the evening news. He said, the world's on fire. Something's wrong. In the verse 50, he says, I'm going to be baptized with a baptism of suffering. I am going to be dunked in suffering. I am going to be miserably drowned in suffering. I am going to be completely immersed and soaked to the bone in suffering. And he's not thrilled about it. He's consistently not thrilled about it. You go to the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, Father, if there be any way to take this cup away from me, let it be. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He's not thrilled about it. But he says, I know that suffering is on the horizon. I can see the weather. And then he says, yeah, we've got division instead of peace. Messiah has come. That's what Jesus has been telling him. Messiah has come with healing in his wings. And all you see is division everywhere I go. Something's wrong. Something's very, very wrong. And what Jesus doesn't name, but the people also don't understand is what is the disease beneath the symptoms. And that's an important concept for us to understand. We need to be the kind of people who look beyond just symptoms and look for the disease. If you come into the emergency room and you say, I'm in a lot of pain, and the doctor says, here's a pain pill, that treats a symptom, but no one thinks that actually fixes anything, right? Do we get that? I know in a world of fast and easy prescriptions, we sometimes fool ourselves in believing that will take care of it. But it really doesn't. There's a problem causing the pain. You go to the ER and you've got a 106 degree fever. Your brain is melting. And the doctor says, we probably ought to cool you down. Well, that's not a bad idea. But I'd kind of like to know why my fever is 106 degrees. Eventually, I can't live in an ice bath for the rest of my life. Eventually, we've got to do something about this fever. What's wrong with me? Christians have to think this way as well, and too often we don't. In our world, we have two kinds of people when it comes to a crisis, a problem. We have policymakers. Policymakers attempt to address the symptoms of our crisis. That's not a bad thing. Remember, if you go to the ER and your temperature is 106 degrees, yeah, they probably ought to do something about that. But we also know that's not enough. You've treated a symptom. It hasn't fixed the problem. The alternative to being a policymaker is to be a peacemaker. To say there is a problem deep down in the human heart, and we're going to have to do something about that, because that's the disease. You see the difference? There's a big difference. And maybe our government is only equipped to make policies. Maybe the best they can do is to be good policymakers. And I'd like to see them try that. But Christians are equipped to do something more. When Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount that the peacemakers will be called the sons of God, 
He's saying that is essential to our identity. We have the capacity to bring about a change in the world that is more fundamental than a policy shift, but actually changes the way people think, the way they encounter right and wrong, the way they interact with each other, to actually be more like Christ. Christians have that capacity. Maybe policymakers don't. I think when people looked at Jesus, they saw symptoms. He wasn't getting along with the Pharisees very well. Troublemaker. Wasn't getting along with the Sadducees very well. Troublemaker. Wasn't getting along with the priest very well. Troublemaker. Folks, those are symptoms. The disease question is this. Why is it that no one gets along with the Messiah, the Son of God? What does that say about us? Let me give you another way of thinking about this same question, just with two other words instead. There's a difference between being a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. A peacekeeper attempts to maintain the status quo even if the peace is really a lie. Uh, Talk to a a recent veteran sometime who has been on one of those many uh, peacekeeping ventures that we do overseas. I'm not even saying they're bad. Again, I'm actually trying to stay out of politics today. I'm not doing a great job, but I'm trying. I'm not saying those are bad, but ask a veteran who's been in that capacity overseas as a peacekeeper. And anytime I talk to one, they tell me the same thing. We did not have the power to actually make anything better. We were given unclear guidelines to try to keep the status quo, to keep things quiet in hopes that somebody else fix the problems in the world. That's peacekeeping. Okay? And that's probably a good thing. Kind of like policymaking, it's probably a good thing. Somebody ought to do that. But peacemaking is very different. Pilate, the governor who crucifies Jesus, is a peacekeeper. There's a man in Jerusalem who's been causing trouble. The high priest bring that man to him and say, we're about to have a lot of trouble. We'll give you a way out. Crucify that man. He says, I don't want to. He doesn't seem to be guilty of anything. They say, we don't care. If you don't want trouble, get rid of that man. And Pilate says, that's kind of my job, isn't it? His job is not to make the Jewish people better. His job is to keep them quiet, to make sure there are no riots in the streets of Jerusalem. And if that means crucifying an innocent man, he says, I can do that. I'm not fond of it, but it'll keep you hushed. Pilate is a magnificent peacekeeper. He's not a peacemaker. He's not actually attempting to solve the problem. He doesn't say, what kind of people are you that want to crucify a man so good? He doesn't try to bring about reconciliation. He's only looking at the problem on the surface. And let me tell you, that is a theme. If you read the Old Testament prophetic literature, any of the prophets, that is a theme that comes up over and over and over again. That there were people who were in a position of just trying to get along and keep things quiet. And then along comes the prophet. And he says, you're sinning, better quit that. And how do they respond? You remember 1 Kings chapter 18, 17 through 18? Elijah comes to Ahab the king, and he says, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? He says, Everywhere you go, Elijah, I've got to fight. Of course, Elijah says it more plainly. I have not troubled Israel. You have troubled Israel in your father's house because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. What's the difference? Ahab's talking about symptoms. Everywhere Elijah go, people get upset. Elijah's talking about a disease. He said, you left the Lord your God, and that's why you don't like it when I talk. One of them is a peacekeeper. One's trying to make peace by reconciling people to their God. And there is a huge difference between the two. One of the sternest and oft-repeated warning to prophets in the Old Testament is never settle for fake peace. In Jeremiah, for example, verses six and verse four, or chapter 6, verse 14, he speaks of the false prophets and says, They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. What was the crime? Well, they were healing the people, weren't they? He said, lightly. Putting a little salve on it. Ignoring the actual problem to tell people everything's okay. He says, that's not peace. 
So important is this phrase, it keeps getting repeated in Jeremiah 8, 11, Ezekiel 13, 10, Ezekiel 13, 16. Over and over again, the false prophets are blamed because they were the ones that said, shh, everything's okay. Don't talk about it. And it was the prophet of God that came to town and said, we have a problem and we've got to talk about it. Because if we don't talk about it, we heal the people lightly. I love that phrase, by the way. You heal the people lightly. Got a broken bone? Here's an aspirin. That'll fix it. I guess it's better than nothing, but it's not going to fix anything. And that, I think, is the challenge of so many of these topics we talk about. Paul says that's what we're going to be doing right up till the end of time. (laughs) It's a common human condition. In describing the end of the world, in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 3, he says, While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. What these passages have shown us is that if we settle for fake peace, we're setting ourselves up for disaster. Because we're not dealing with the actual problem. True peace might require some conflict. Do you understand this now? When I do a little bit of counseling, not a whole lot, I do a little bit, both premarital counseling and sometimes marital counseling, uh, before the problem and after the problem, premarital and marital, right? One of the things we talk about is conflict is not necessarily a problem. In fact, for premarital counseling, if they say, we've never even had an argument, I said, you don't know each other well enough yet. How dare you get married? Go fight about something and come back, and we'll figure out if you know each other or not. If you don't care about each other enough to actually have an opinion and disagree on something, what do you think of getting married? Because you're going to have a fight eventually, and you probably ought to figure out how to handle that. Conflict isn't necessarily bad. There are bad ways to have conflict. But dealing with problems in an honest fashion is healthy. And you find out couples who don't do that don't make it. They sit quietly trying to keep the peace while their marriage falls apart. Can I tell you, churches do the same thing on a regular basis. In churches, we can be peacemakers or peacekeepers. We can say, we're going to do the thing that makes the least number of people unhappy at any given moment. We're going to think about what things look like and what they sound like and how we think people might respond to it. Or we can deal with reality. And peacekeeping is always easier. Peacekeeping is always more satisfying. Because you feel like I was diplomatic and we got along and no one's upset with anybody. We're still all upset, we're just not saying it out loud. That's the difference between peacekeeping and peacemaking. Peacemaking says, maybe there's a problem. And maybe we should talk about it. Maybe we should be direct and candid and actually talk about what's going on. What kind of people are we if we don't? Why do you not know how to interpret the present time? That's the question at the end of this section from Jesus. He wants you to take a serious look in the mirror and not turn away from what you see. Don't be satisfied with a superficial peace. Ask the tough questions. I've been asking some tough questions of myself, and I wonder and I worry about problems that we have overlooked as a congregation rather than actually talked about. It's easy to look at symptoms. And so we have a couple of options. Option A, never ever talk about it. We could not worry about what the weather might tell us. We could not deal with reality. We could avoid conflict at all cost and hope things just kind of get better. Or we could take that great, terrible, beautiful mirror of the scriptures and hold it up to our own faces and saying, where am I failing this congregation? How could I do more to help right the ship? What could I do to make us who we ought to be? That's the kind of peace that Christ brings us. Not a peace that looks over problems, but a peace that actually comes to know what peace is by addressing problems. There is nothing more unsettling in the human heart 
than a lingering problem. Something where you say, I know something's amiss, but I'm going to put it off till tomorrow. And every time you do, you die a little inside. Christ says, that's not peace. And so, yeah, I'm going to burn the world down, he says. Yes, there will be no more superficial peace but division everywhere I go. He says, yes, they're going to kill me for it. Because real peace, real struggle, real growth is worth the price of doing those things. Why in our culture do we have violence rather than peace? Something is wrong deep down in the human heart. And our culture has either got to look at it in the face or get used to it. I don't want to get used to it. I'm tired of seeing it on the news. I think we have to talk about it and say, what is going on? Why is the world on fire? Why is our country angry and divided? Why is our civilization angry and divided, bitter and resentful? See, it works on the national level, it works on the church level, it works on the personal level. So here's what we've got to do. Number one, Christians ought to, by which I mean must, work toward reconciliation, not strife. Do not use the I came to bring a sword, not peace verse as an excuse to be ugly to your fellow man. As I quote so often from my professor Jim Baird, don't be a jerk for Jesus, right? The devil's got plenty of mean, ugly people. You don't have to be one. When Jesus says, I came not to bring peace but a sword, he doesn't mean go out and be mean to each other. He's saying that the price of reconciliation will sometimes be enduring some conflict. Christians create peace by fighting the disease, not the symptoms. There are no easy solutions to the problem of your life, to the problem of your church, to the problem of your nation. You want to be popular? Offer an easy solution. Tune in anytime you want to a presidential debate, right? And you're going to get a guy behind a microphone offering the easiest possible solution because people love that and they'll vote for it. Want to be a popular preacher? Give everybody a three-step program that grows the church. That sounds easy. The end. There are no easy solutions. They don't exist. And if you want to feel comfortable about your life, take the easy route. But Christians know it doesn't work that way. We fight the disease, not the symptoms. And Christians create peace by engaging conflict as Christians, not avoiding them for false peace. We talk about the things that need to be talked about. We deal with reality of our problems in our homes, in our marriage, with our children, with our church, with our nation, with our country, with our world, with our God. We deal with reality. No more peace, peace when there is no peace. We're going to talk about the truth. So that's my commitment to you. I want to do better about telling the truth. Not because I've been lying. I don't think I have been. But because I think it's important for us to look reality in the face and think about what it means and what we can do about it. What I need from each and every one of you, and more importantly, what God needs from each and every one of us, is to be the kind of people who want to fix those problems, who want to bring peace to the world that's broken and sad. And we're not going to settle for anything less. Start in your own life. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ through faith, through obedience, through forgiveness of your sins, through active membership in a local church, by doing something that makes you more like Christ, if you're not doing that, you do not have peace in your life. And there is no easy route to being able to look in the mirror and sleep at night and do all the things that a peaceful person can do. Instead, you have to make tough decisions. You have to reconcile yourself to God. You have to realize that it takes less of myself and more of him to be at peace with him. And you have to change things about yourself that might be painful. But that's how we get peace. Nothing short of that is possible.